What is up guys, Rick Hackus here, and this is King's Fall for Dummies, the complete raid guide going over every single encounter, every single jumping puzzle, and every single chest we know about. Now this was a ton of work to put this guide together, so if you find this guide helpful, please remember to help me out by simply rating or sharing this video. Now without further ado, let's get started. Now when you start up the raid, there's actually going to be a sort of pre-raid activity. You have to beat this challenge in order to get into the actual raid. Now you're going to spawn right in front of the Court of Oryx. Now there's going to be six statues leading to the court and activating each one of these statues is going to open the portal at the Court of Oryx and that's again going to lead into the actual raid. So how do you activate these statues? All you need to do is have two members of your team go and pick up the relics that are going to be right in front of you when you start the raid. They both take these relics, take it down to the statue that is the proper statue. There's only going to be one statue that has even the option to put these relics into it. Both teammates then put the relics in, they slam the relics into the statue at about the same time and that's going to trigger that statue and move it to another different statue to which you have to go and get Get two more different relics. Now one relic is always going to spawn on the right side of the map and the other relic is always going to spawn on the left side of the map. Each time you complete a statue the new relic will spawn a little bit further than the previous one. This encounter is really pretty simple. Simply have your team of six split up into three and three and have a team dedicated to the right relic and a team dedicated to the left relic. Have the two teammates that aren't carrying the relic defend the relic carrier. You actually really do want to watch out for the taken phalanx cabals because they can actually blast you off the edge and you can fall to your death. But you can often just distract some of the adds with grenades, with killing some of them, and simply ignore the rest, running your relic carrier through, and then meeting in the middle, right in front of the statues, to ensure that both players carrying the relic slam the statue at the same time. Now along the way there's going to be these transparent barriers that appear along the route the relic carrier has to run to reach the statues again. If you're defending the relic carrier, simply make sure to shoot these barriers down as quickly as possible when they appear so the relic carrier can run through. Now you do want to try to do this encounter quickly because it is slightly timed. If you take too long to activate a statue, it will deactivate and you'll actually have to go back one and activate the previous statue again. This encounter is relatively easy, you should be able to get this no problem. You may wipe a few times simply because the spawns are semi-randomized, so sometimes you can have a little bit of trouble finding a relic, but the rule of thumb is that if you can't find the relic, you passed it. Now when all the statues are activated, again it's going to open the portal on the Court of Oryx. You simply have to run through, you do not have to kill any of the enemies that spawn when the portal opens. Once you get through the portal, you're going to find a chest immediately that's going to open when all six members of your fire team are in the actual raid. The chest awards moldering shards. Now if you're like, what the heck are moldering shards? They're pretty useless. All they do is that when you hold 20 moldering shards, at the end of the raid, it's actually going to take away 20 of them. So if you have like 23 at the end, you're going to go back to three. And when it does this, you have a better chance of getting loot. You're next going to have to jump across some swinging lanterns, there's really no trick to it, just try to time it right, and then you're actually going to enter another jumping puzzle. This jumping puzzle is going to have you jump on top of a hive ship that's leaving the station essentially. There's a lot of other hive ships that are moving around in this large open area and you have to know which ones to jump to because you jump from hive ship to hive ship to hive ship to eventually get across the entire area and to the platform on the other side. Now instead of me trying to explain it, I'm just going to show you right now the exact route you need to take.
Now when you eventually get to the platform on the other side, there's going to be another hive ship that's leaving the station. This time it's simply going to go straight, but you'll see that it goes through a large green barrier. If you're on the ship, when it tries to go through this barrier, it's simply going to push you off and you'll fall to your death. So how do you open the barrier? You simply have two players stand on two plates that are on either side of this far platform. They're very easy to find. So the mechanics for this section are simply have two players stand on the plate that's going to open the barrier, the rest of the players hop on the ship, go through the barrier and go to the other side. When you're on the other side, there's two more platforms that hold open the barrier. So once you're on the other side and you're holding open the barrier, the two people that are on the initial side on the platforms then jump onto the ship and go through. However, this is also where you're going to find your first chest. Just before you hit the barrier, jump off of the hive ship and there's kind of a passageway that leads up the wall and into a secret room. To get into this room, you actually do need to open a door and the door is open the exact same way that the green barrier is by having two players stand on the two plates. So what you should do for this segment is simply have two players hold open the portals on the first initial side, the rest of the players jump on the hive ship, jump off to the left to go and get the chest. Once they loot the chest, they jump down onto the far platform, hold open the two new portals, and let the two players that were holding open the initial portals jump on the hive ship, jump off to the left, get the chest, and continue along with the raid. Now once your entire team is on the other side, you simply need to travel up a grav lift and then you're going to find your first real encounter. Now this grav lift can be a little tricky and sometimes players can actually get stuck at the top of it. If this happens, simply have one teammate keep running forward and then he's going to trigger the allies joining you in 4, 3, 2, 1 and everyone stuck will teleport to where he is. Now the next encounter is going to be your first real challenge of the raid. And all it is, is essentially a glorified game of hot potato. You're going to see a plate in the middle of the room right in front of you. On either side are going to be these misty rooms that have two totems of annihilation. Once you start the encounter, you have to have someone always on these two totems. If someone's off one of the totems, you'll have only a few seconds to get someone back on, or your entire team will be killed and you'll have to start again. The problem is also that the misty room, while you're in it, it will actually continually damage you until you die. You can avoid this from picking up a black orb that appears right before you enter uh, the misty room and that's going to create a shield around you. The person who has the shield and any teammates inside the shield will not get damaged while standing on the annihilator totems in these misty rooms. Now the problem is that the shield only actually lasts for 30 seconds and when it goes away it passes to another teammate that is within the shield's radius. So make sure you have another teammate with you when the shield passes because you want it to go to a teammate rather than just disappear altogether. If you have the shield and it passes to a teammate, what's going to happen is that you're going to get a new mechanic called Death Singer's Gaze times 10. When you have this new Death Singer's Gaze times 10, you can actually go back to the middle room and when you stand on the middle platform with this Death Singer's Gaze active, that's what's actually going to decrypt the ruins on the main door in front of you and let you go to the next encounter. And those are all the mechanics of this section. So what you're going to want to do is have your team of six split into two teams of three, a right team and a left team. So if you're on the right team, you're going to have two members of the three person team go, one actually goes and collects the black orb and both of them then go and travel to the annihilator totem. One person from the right team stays in the middle and simply kills ads. The two people at the Annihilator Totem will simply kill ads. There is a Boomer Knight that spawns up in the kind of top level. You definitely want to keep an eye on this guy. He has killed many a person. But in any event, when the shield wears out and it passes from one of the players around the Annihilator Totem to the other one, the player that originally had it, who now has Deathsinger's Gaze times 10, runs to the middle platform. 
When he does this, he simply calls out his teammate's name that is at the middle platform currently. You say, hey, Jim, get down there. I'm switching with you. The person at the middle switches positions with the person who has the Death Singer's gaze and the person in the middle goes down and joins the other person who has newly got the shield in the Annihilator Totem. The person who has the Death Singer's gaze times 10 simply stands in this middle platform until his Death Singer's gaze is gone. Once you don't have any more Death Singer's gaze, like once it's gone from your screen, there's no reason for you to be in that middle platform anymore. You can simply start heading down to the Annihilator Totem, barring staying in the middle a few seconds to kill some ads. In the meantime, the two players at the Annihilator Totem are going to transfer the shield again, and then a new person is going to get to Death Singer's gaze and have to go to the middle. And although that's described for the right team, the left team is going to be doing the exact same thing. And that's really all this encounter is. You simply have to hold open the Annihilator Totems, and you have to have two players near there to juggle the shield when it transfers from one player to the other. When it leaves you, you have the Death Singer's Gaze, so you have to go to the middle, and then the person in the middle goes to the Annihilator Totem so he can get the next shield. Again, it's glorified hot potato. <laughs> Communication is key for this part. It's really important to let your guy know, hey, I'm switching with you right now, get over to the Annihilator Totem, and so on. If there's ever three people in the middle platform, something has gone terribly wrong. If someone dies in this encounter, it's actually not the biggest deal. You can fight through it, but again, make sure someone is at the Annihilator Totem. What's probably going to happen is that if someone dies and then no one has the shield, send someone over to the Annihilator Totem and they're just going to die. They're going to stand there and slowly die. There's nothing they can do about it, but it's going to keep your team from losing. And hopefully another player can wait until the Black Orb respawns, get the shield, get back to the Annihilator Totem with the shield, and and revive the teammates that died in the Annihilator Totem. Once enough players with the Death Singer's Gaze have stood on the middle platform, that's going to activate all the runes of the big door in front of you, and eventually it's going to open and lead to the next encounter. The next encounter is your first boss fight, and it is the War Priest. So when you enter this encounter, you're going to see that there is three different plates, one in the very middle, one off to the right, and one on the high left platform. Each of these plates has a massive stone pillar in front of it. You're going to want to split your team up into three teams of two, with two players staying around each one of these plates. So two players in the middle, two players on the right plate, and two players on the upper left plate. When everyone is standing on all three of these pillars at the same time, it's going to spawn the boss and start the encounter. At this point, each team simply starts killing all the adds around them. When they've killed a few adds, eventually three Hallowed Knights will spawn and each team has to take out their own Hallowed Knight. When you kill all three of these knights, you're going to see a text down at the bottom left of your screen that says the glyph sequence has started and then you have to stand on your plates in a certain order. Now there's a massive amount of confusion about what the order actually is, but I'm here to clear all that confusion up because it's actually very simple. On the back of each one of these large stone pillars in front of all of the different plates, there is actually a part that glows. And this glowing order is what's shown when you simply send a player back behind these pillars. So when you've killed the knights, it's going to pop up and say, okay, the glyph sequence has started. Simply send a player, usually we send our player from the top left to simply go a little bit forward and then so he can see the backs of all of these stone pillars. One of the backs of the pillars is going to light up. It's going to be very obvious and he's going to call it out. Okay, right plate. For example, the team on the right stand on their plate and stay standing on their plate. And then a new pillar will glow. And so let's say it's the left one this time. And the person who's looking for this is going to call it out. Okay, left plate. The person on the left then stands on their plate and again stays there. And then obviously the back of the middle pillar is going to glow and then the middle team go and stand on their plate. 
Once the glyph sequence has been entered correctly, what's going to happen is that the last person to stand on the plate to activate it is going to get a glowing red bubble around them called Aura of the Initiate. Anyone inside this bubble can actually do damage to the boss. So what you're going to want to do after entering the glyph sequence is meet in a predetermined spot and simply go to town on the boss. Our team preferred meeting in the middle first, simply near the middle plate. Everyone jumps off their plates, goes and meets in the middle, all stands in this red bubble, and again just goes to town against the boss. You know, tethers are really good against this boss, weapons of light are really good, snipers are really good. You actually really do want to have some snipers because you want to start stunning him. If you don't put him in a stun lock pretty early, he has like a boomer gun and he can do a lot of damage to your team. Now, if you actually are the one holding the aura of initiate, you'll notice that you have a timer to the bottom left of your screen. It's only a 10 second timer and when this timer runs out, you will die and it will pass to another teammate. It's only going to pass to four teammates and then it's going to go away. Now what you can do to avoid dying is simply kill an ad. If you kill an ad, it resets the timer, but it also takes away one of those four transfers. So the absolute worst thing you can do if you have the aura of initiate is throw a grenade and kill four enemies all at once. That's going to completely cause the aura to go away and you'll get basically no damage on the boss. If you have the aura of initiate, what you want to do is kill an ad at like one or two seconds before it goes away. That's going to use up one of the transfers, but it's also going to reset it back at nine, ten seconds. If you do it properly and kill an enemy at like one second every time, your team is going to have a lot of time to damage this boss. However, players often mess this up and they end up dying with the aura. If you do, it's not the biggest deal. Just shout out, okay, I'm dead, the aura is transferring, and pay attention if you're the new person who gets the aura so that you can go into killing ads at one second. When the aura eventually wears out, the oculus is going to spawn. There's going to be a massive glowing flash of light from this orb in the middle of the map. This glowing light will kill everything in the room unless you're standing in the shadow of the large stone pillar in front of the plates. So that's why you want to meet, let's say, in the middle first near the plate so that when it starts glowing, you can all just huddle in the shadow of the pillar and you'll be safe. When the oculus is done glowing, it's actually going to destroy the stone pillar you were hiding behind. All this means is that you're going to have to have a new meeting place. So if you met in the middle, you're going to go meet by the right pillar this time. So you can hide behind that one, and then when that one gets destroyed, you'll go to the upper left. If all three stone pillars are destroyed, you get one more crack at damaging the boss, but you have to kill him that time with the aura of the initiate, because obviously there's nowhere left to hide. That's really all there is to this encounter. Again, my team likes to start in the middle, then meet at the right, then meet at the upper left, and then back in the middle. The reason for this is we're actually often, you know, with black spindles and stuff, we're able to get enough damage on him that we can kill him after three, sometimes two runs. So we like to meet in the middle first, do a ton of damage. It's very easy to damage him from the middle. It's also a very easy spot to meet. If you're meeting on the top left, some players can have difficulty getting there in time. So again, meet in the middle, damage the crap out of him, then go to the right, and if we don't kill him there, he's usually low enough health that we can just meet in the middle again, and we can kill him before the oculus spawns, so we don't have to worry about hiding behind a pillar. So the summary of this encounter is, stand in all three pillars which will spawn the boss, kill adds until there's three hallowed knights that spawn, kill the hallowed knights, that's going to start the glyph sequence, send someone to see the backs of the large stone pillars, which is going to tell you the order to enter the glyph sequence. When you enter the order correctly, it's going to give the large red bubble to someone. The person with the bubble goes to where everyone on the team meets, everyone stands in this bubble, goes to town on the boss. Boss, the person who actually has the bubble damages ads at one second to extend the length as long as possible and when the bubble goes away it's going to trigger the oculus to spawn that kills everything that isn't hiding behind the shadow of the pillar that you're nearest to. The pillar that you're hiding behind is going to be destroyed so you simply need to have a new meeting spot near a new pillar. 
And in case you're wondering how to tell what the sequence is when these pillars are being destroyed, what's going to happen is that if the pillar gets destroyed, there's actually going to be a large orange-like flame that appears that is going to indicate uh, the sequence order and when to get on that plate. Now once you beat that encounter, you're moving on to a labyrinth that you have to find your way through to get to the next encounter, but inside this labyrinth is actually a chest. What you're seeing on screen right now is actually a pretty simplified version of the map of the labyrinth. You can see that the map has an entrance and an exit, so to find your way through you need to take the first right, then the first left, the next left, and the next right. Go straight and you'll find your way out. However, you can also see that there's plates marked 1, 2, 3, and 4. To get the chest on this part, you simply need to spread your team out so one person is standing near each one of these different plates, and you need to hop on these plates in the right order. Now you always start with plate number three that you're seeing on screen right now. So someone hops on plate number three. If it's the correct one to hop on, you'll hear a loud bang. When you hear one loud bang, you know that's the correct order. Then you simply get a random teammate to hop on one of their plates. Let's say it's number two next. If it's the right one, you'll hear no sound at all. If it's the wrong one, you're going to hear a bunch of banging in a row. So let's say you start with plate 3, plate 4 hops on, it's correct, you're going to hear nothing. Plate 1 hops on, if that actually is correct, you're going to hear one loud bang. So usually if you hear nothing or one loud bang, that means it's correct. Again, if you hear a bunch of banging, it's going to be really obvious, uh, then that's the wrong order. And you simply just do trial and error until you figure out the right order of the plates to jump on. And then that's going to trigger the door to open and you're going to be available to grab the chest. Now once you've made your way through the labyrinth, we have the Golgoroth fight. Now many players consider this fight one of the more difficult encounters in the raid, however I have a strategy that's going to make this fight pretty darn easy. What you need to do to start the encounter is shoot the watery orb up in the top middle of the map. That's going to drop down and Golgoroth the ogre is going to spawn. You're going to see right away that he has a crit on his back where these spidery arms are. Shooting this crit is actually going to get his gaze. When his gaze is on you, he's going to focus at nothing else but you. And he's going to shoot these large orbs out from his stomach at you. Uh, they're very similar to the orbs that the taken centurions actually shoot at you so it's very easy when his gaze is on you simply stand where there's like basically no cover there's a lot of visibility in between him and you and look directly at him and simply shoot the orbs that are coming out of his stomach and you should be able to survive that no problem when his gaze is on someone there's going to be a new crit on his stomach that opens up so here's how you kill Golgoroth Firstly, trigger him to spawn, and that's also going to trigger a wave of adds to spawn. There's going to be a bunch of thralls that run in the left and right upper platforms. Kill these thralls, and they're going to be followed by acolytes. There's going to be normal acolytes and adept acolytes. You simply want to kill all of these things as quickly as possible. Sunbreaker Titans are actually pretty good for killing these adds extremely quickly. Once you've killed all the acolytes on both the upper right and the upper left side, that's it. No more adds will spawn. At least not yet. So when you've killed all the adds, you'll then notice that, okay, now there's six more watery orbs above Golgoroth. What you need to do is shoot one of these orbs. We prefer the front left one. That's going to cause water to splash down, and that's going to make a pool of reclaimed light. When you're in this pool of reclaimed light, you're going to be doing massive, massive bonus damage to Golgoroth. So when you've killed all the adds, shoot down the front left orb of water. That's going to make a pool of reclaimed light, and simply dedicate one person on your team to be the gaze grabber. What he's going to do is shoot Golgoroth's back and grab his gaze. When Golgoroth's gaze is focused on that player, every other player hops down into the pool of reclaimed light and absolutely goes to town on Golgoroth's stomach crit. The person who has Golgoroth's gaze needs to make sure that he's in a position that Golgoroth's stomach is facing the team doing the damage. 
There's actually a couple of elevated boxes in the uh, front left-ish corner of the encounter. And if you're standing on top of one of these boxes, since Golgoth's back kind of is elevated just a little bit, you can usually like actually hit his back crit from the front just by hitting, again, the ooze that's kind of bubbled up on his back. And then you won't have to, you know, go to the side or go behind him, shoot him, and then run all the way to the front so he's actually facing the damaging team. So again, stand in one of these elevated boxes boxes near the front of the encounter, shoot his back from there, you'll grab his gaze, everyone else jumps down into the pool of reclaimed light and again goes to town on his stomach. The person who has Golgoth's gaze needs to make it very, very clear to the rest of the team what the gaze is at. He's gonna say, okay guys, five seconds, four, three, two, one, get out of there, and when his gaze is done, and Golgoth can actually start damaging other people, everyone doing the damage in the Pool of Reclaim Light jumps out of there, and that's about it. When his gaze is over, it's going to cause another wave of adds to spawn. So you're going to kill Thralls again, kill Acolytes again. Once you've killed all the Acolytes, you're just going to do that exact same thing again. Hit the Orb of Water, make the Pool of Reclaim light. When the Gaze Grabber gets his gaze and calls it, Okay, guys, I've got his gaze. Everyone hops down into the Pool of Reclaim light, goes to town on his stomach until the gaze is gone. They hop out and adds are going to spawn and you just keep doing that same thing. That's really all there is to it. The only other thing to keep in mind in this encounter is that about halfway through to about three quarters through, there's going to be no more Hive that spawn and they're going to be replaced with Taken. When this happens, it's actually kind of a good thing because there's not going to be a bunch of Taken Acolytes that spawn. It's just going to be a few Taken Thralls. So when the Taken are spawning, you can be shooting down that orb a lot more often. You just want to make sure that when you're down in the pool of Reclaim Light, you don't get overwhelmed. So save your area of effect grenades for that encounter. Maybe even have one person on the damaging team just focusing on killing Thralls so they don't kill your team. Now this is actually really important because if you get a certain amount of deaths, I think it's 6 or 7, you're just going to lose. The totem in the middle is going to activate and your entire team will wipe and you'll have to restart. So really be careful in this encounter and try not to die. Like the last boss, sniper rifles are going to be absolutely insane for dealing damage, and so are machine guns. If you don't have a good machine gun, don't use rocket launchers on Golgroth. It doesn't actually do that much damage, and since your entire team is bunched together, you do have a chance of hitting your teammate and killing yourself. If you have a good rocket launcher, use it for killing the adds quick, as quickly as possible. Like, if you have a really good rocket launcher, you can take out a bunch of acolytes all at once. That's going to help the encounter as well. Now that's it for the Golgroth encounter, and after that you're going to be faced with yet another jumping puzzle. This puzzle is going to have you skim across two different walls of this large open area. Now along the platforms to get through this encounter there's going to be these massive pillars that jut out and can send you flying across the map and kill you. Now the only real trick to this section is that all of the platforms next to these pillars that jut out um, are always big enough to allow you to stand like right in front of the pillar, wait for it to jut out like it juts out if you're near it, and then wait for it to slowly go back, in which case when it goes back then make your run because it's going to be a few seconds until it activates again. Now the only other mechanic in this jumping puzzle is that there's going to be plates that holding open these plates, if you have a teammate that's holding one of these open, it's going to build a bridge to the next plate. Now if your player standing on the plate goes off of it, it's going to disintegrate the bridge. So simply have your player holding open the plate, everyone goes across, and when everyone's across, the last player who is holding open a plate can now go across as well because the bridge is no longer going to disintegrate. Now in this jumping puzzle, there's yet another chest, but this chest is different. This is actually a confirmed exotic chest. Yes, you can get exotic weapons and armor out of this chest. Now here's how you get to it. Simply go to the very first plate that you see along your way. Hold open your ghost, like take out your ghost, and you're going to see that there's actually hidden platforms nearby. Just like there were in the Taken King campaign. 
Now you're going to see me in this gameplay take the exact route that you need to get to the chest, but essentially you utilize this large pillar that's in the middle of the area. It has these small platforms on it that you can jump to. Utilize this large pillar and its platforms and the kind of invisible platforms in the middle of the air that you use your ghost to find to make your way up, up, up until you find the hidden room to which this chest is a part of. And yes, this is actually an exotic chest. There's actually a lot of confusion about this because the chances to get exotics are actually pretty low and there hasn't been a lot of recorded proof. However, one of my teammates, OKC Connor, actually has a smaller channel himself and he was recording at the time that he actually got an exotic piece of armor, a hunter exotic helmet to be exact. So I'm going to put an annotation on screen right now that's going to link to his video so you should check it out if you want to see the actual proof that this is an exotic chest. Now after you get the chest, here's the exact route you take to complete this jumping puzzle. Okay, so now that you're through the jumping puzzle, you're going to face the second last encounter of this raid. Beat this encounter and you'll finally face Oryx himself. Now this encounter is going to have two death singers on two elevated platforms, both surrounded by shields that make them invincible. You're going to notice immediately that a random member of your team suddenly becomes invisible and it says that they're torn in between dimensions. Now in this area, there's going to be four elevated platforms, one on the front left, one on the front right, and one in the back left and back right uh, beyond the Death Singer platforms. Above one of these platforms is going to be an objective. So here's what you need to do. Assign one person from your fire team to go to each different of these elevated plates. You're then going to have whoever is invisible and you'll have one extra player. This extra player is just going to be in the middle focusing on killing ads. You start the encounter by hopping on one of the plates and you have to hop on the plates in the correct order to build a bridge, essentially build these platforms up, up, up to the objective, in which case you get the objective and I'll explain that later. Essentially what you need to do is that you need to start in the right order. The right order is counterclockwise, so let's say the objective is above the back left hand corner, alright? If the objective is above there, you're going to start in the front left hand corner, then it's going to go to the front right, back right, like that's the counterclockwise order you need to go in. So whatever platform has the objective above it, you start one to the left going counterclockwise. The person who is torn between the dimensions and the person assigned to this platform hop on it at the same time. Once they're both on the platform and it triggers the event, the next person on the left going counterclockwise is going to hop on. And then the next person on the left is going to hop on. Remember, you have to hop on in a certain order. One to the left, one at a time going counterclockwise. The last person to hop on is the person with the objective directly above his platform. The person that's invisible then jumps from platform to platform that's being built in front of him until he eventually reaches the objective. When you reach the objective, which is going to be one of those black orbs of light, there's no picking up, there's no nothing, you simply need to stand beside it until it kind of envelops into your body, it's going to be very obvious when you have it, and when your kind of screen changes color, it's absorbed into your body, you're then going to jump off of the platform and go down to one of the Death Singers. And by one of the Death Singers, I always mean the left Death Singer if you're facing forward from the beginning of the encounter. A good way to remember is that this left death singer will simply be chilling, it won't be doing anything, it's just going to be standing there, and the one on the right is going to be glowing red and freaking out. Do not bother the freaking out one, go for the one that's just chilling. 
So you've absorbed the orb of light where the objective is and then you hop down at the death singer that's just standing there holding on the PS4 it's square. Uh, so you gotta hold the button that lets you slam objectives so at the very beginning of the raid whatever button you use to put those orbs into those statues you're gonna be holding that same button and then you're going to actually do a slam on the death singer and take her invincibility shield. Once you have her invincibility shield, everyone hops off their platforms and all runs to the middle staircase where you kind of started this encounter and absolutely goes to town DPSing the Death Singer that you took the shield from. You may want to assign one player to actually deal with ads because eventually the invincibility shield will go away. There's going to be a big flash of light that's going to kill any guardian who's not inside the bubble that the player that grabbed the invincibility shield has. So if you're a little bit outside, you will die. So you want to stay inside, but it won't kill the ads or anything. So eventually the bubble is going to go away. And if no one has killed any ads, they are going to kill you when you come out of this invincibility bubble. But again, simply dedicating one member of your fire team to just ignore the boss and just deal with these ads should be good enough. If you have a Sunbreaker Titan, that's going to be excellent for just killing all the ads right away. And then he can probably kill all the ads even and then start damaging the boss as well. Now it's also very important that unless you're a really intense team, don't kill the first boss. The reason you don't want to kill the first boss in one go is that you're actually then going to have to kill the second boss in one go. If you're confident that you can kill the second boss, by all means kill the first one, but you may want to just hurt the first Death Singer a lot until she's like well below half, but then cool it, don't kill her, and then you don't have to kill the next Death Singer that you're going to damage, which is the one on the right, and then you can go finish off the one on the left, and then finish off the one on the right. Now that's really all there is to it to beating this encounter. You simply have to assign one person to each of the four different plates. You then have the person who is invisible hop up from the platforms that are built by going on the plates in the right order. I remember the right order is you always start one to the left of the plate that has the objective directly above it counterclockwise. Once the player torn between dimensions absorbs the orb of light where the objective is, he's going to jump down at the left Death Singer first, then the right, then the left, then the right, and he's going to take their invincibility shield by holding square on the PS4 and whatever it is on the Xbox, and then everyone's going to go down, meet in the staircase at the beginning of the encounter, and just DPS the crap out of the boss. The only other thing I want to mention is that at 40 seconds, because there will actually be a timer for the person who is invisible to go all the way up and grab the objective, so if they fall, they really need to go really fast to try to do it again, but if they fall, it's probably going to end up in a wipe. In any event, at 40 seconds, it's going to spawn a vandal off to the distance uh, above each of the platforms, so you really want to try to make sure that you take down this vandal, because they're assholes and they'll definitely kill you. Now once you beat the Death Singers, we have Oryx himself. Now there is a lot of different things going on in this encounter, so please bear with me. Now you're actually going to trigger this encounter by going to where the orb of little bouncing light is at the very front of this platform, and then that's going to spawn Big Daddy Oryx. At this point, everyone goes back to their assigned plate because you're going to be doing that whole Torn Between Dimensions jumping puzzle all over again. So Oryx is going to move from his original position in the very front of the map and he's going to go to the side facing one of these plates. He's then going to take his fist and slam on top of the plate. Obviously, if that's your plate, don't be standing on it when he does that. But wherever plate he slams is going to be where you want your relic carrier to go. Your relic carrier is going to be the person most comfortable with doing the platforming challenge from the last encounter because again, he's going to be doing the same thing. So he's going to slam a platform and then there's going to be one of those black orbs that actually appears there. The person who's the relic carrier jumps on the plate first, gets this black orb, and then he's going to become torn in between dimensions. Then who's ever assigned to that plate jumps on quickly after. And then again, uh, the next plate counterclockwise jumps on, then the next plate, then the next plate. And the person who's torn between dimensions simply jumps up the platforms until he reaches the objective just like the last one. 
Once he gets the objective, instead of slamming the Death Singer shields, he's actually going to slam a shield of the Vessel of Orcs, which is a knight that's going to spawn very close to where the Bouncing Orb of Light was, where he first triggered this encounter. So he's going to jump down and steal the Bubble of Invincibility from this knight. And I'm going to pause right here because there's a lot of other mechanics going on while this is all happening. Now, when you jump on your assigned plate, you're actually going to have an ogre that comes out of the puddle near your plate, and you have to kill this ogre as quickly as possible. And I really do mean as quickly as possible. Use all of your stuff. Use your super, use your rock launchers. You want to maybe save some of your sniper for oryx, but you really need to focus on killing this ogre as quickly as possible. Now there is going to be one player that's free to do whatever, he's not assigned to any plates. He's going to simply be on Ogre Patrol. He's going to help whoever's plate the Ogre spawns at first and then simply move from Ogre to Ogre. The Ogres are going to spawn at the order of when someone jumps on the plate. Now a huge tip for you guys that many players don't know about is that the very last person to hop on the plate, the fourth person that would hop on the plate, actually doesn't need to hop on. As long as the third person hops on his plate, it's going to build the platforms all the way to the objective. So whatever player realizes, okay, I'm the last person that's going to hop on the objective, the objective is right above me, you do not hop on your plate, and you travel down and go and help the person on ogre duty. Having two people move from ogre to ogre as they're spawning is really, really helpful, and it's going to allow you guys to kill those ogres very quickly. Now if you make a mistake, if you're the fourth person and you accidentally hop on your platform and then you realize, oh crap, I'm not supposed to hop on, I'm supposed to help fight ogres, do not hop off. You've made a mistake, deal with it, but stay on your platform. Because if you hop off, what that's going to do is that if you leave the plate, it's going to cause the platforms to despawn and that's going to ruin everything. So again, try not to hop on if you're the fourth person, go to ogre duty, but if you make a mistake, stay on. Now you'll notice when you kill these ogres that they will spawn orbs of black light where they die. Do not go in these black orbs yet, we're getting to that mechanic soon. So let's unpause and go back to where the relic carrier has just slammed the vessel of oryx and taken his shield. Everyone at this point is going to hop off of their plates and go and meet in the middle of the map. When everyone meets in the middle, they want to kill the Vessel of Oryx as quickly as possible. Now, when they do that, you might have some time to spare, like Oryx might just be slamming another plate at that point. And if that happens, use your extra time to kill some of the adds around you. After Oryx slams, he's then going to lean back a little bit and his stomach will open. At this point, damage his stomach crit as much as possible. Snipers and machine guns are again great at this part. Supers don't actually do that much, and I'm not even sure a tether does anything. You want to actually save your tether for ogres instead. In any event, your team will be damaging his stomach as much as possible, and then he's going to stagger. The moment you see Oryx stagger back from the damage your team has done to him, you want to go back to near your assigned plate, and then you want to go and stand in these orbs of black light that the ogres dropped when they die. So again, whoever was assigned to that plate goes and stands in the orb of black light that was spawned when their ogre died. Now if you're one of the people that's going to go to these orbs, you simply stand in this orb of black light and look at the bottom left hand corner of your screen and that's going to say your gamer tag. Like for me it's going to be Rick Kakis has uncontaminated or detonated the orb of contaminated light. As soon as you see this text pop up, you run back to the middle and get inside that invincibility bubble. If you don't get there in time, there's going to be a flash of light and you will die. When you get back to the bubble, you continue damaging Oryx until he eventually goes away. Now that's really it for how to damage Oryx. You're going to simply do the, exactly what I've just said four times and you should be able to kill Oryx. However, there are some more mechanics that are going to be occurring along this way. 
Now firstly, there's going to be a point where orcs start shooting these homing explosions at you. And it's going to be very obvious, you're going to have these massive, uh, it's going to actually show a little bit of a glow where this thing is going to land. When that starts occurring, simply run. Just keep running in circles around your plate, never stop, and you should be able to avoid all the explosions. Now if someone dies in this part, it's really not that big of a deal. Simply revive him when all the explosions are done. You don't want to revive someone while it's still going on because they'll simply get hit as they're trying to get up. So again, wait until that whole mechanic is done because it'll just go away after a certain amount of time and then revive whoever died. Now another mechanic that's going to occur after you've damaged Oryx a little bit is that he is going to go back to the middle of the map and he's going to make this big black ball over at the front of the map. And then he's going to start teleporting players one by one into a weird misty circle. It's going to be exactly like the mechanic when you first killed Oryx in the regicide mission in the actual Taken King campaign. Now if you're teleported into this circle, what you want to do is try to kill the Shade of Oryx as quickly as possible. It's going to be hanging out out in the mist, you really got to try to look for it, and then when you see it, just do as much damage to it as quickly as possible. It's really not too too hard to kill, again use your supers for this part, putting down a weapons of light in the middle at this part is great, also tethering it is great. And it should be noted that every once in a while it'll actually kind of charge in out of the mist with a sword and try to hit you. When this happens just jump away like try not to get hit by the sword because it can insta kill you. Now again it's going to teleport players one by one into this misty circle. If you're not in it yet what you want to do is you want to kill the taken thralls that are running into the giant black circle at the front of the map. When they get into this black circle they're actually going to go into the misty circle encounter and it's kind of can be difficult to deal with the shade of oryx and all of these taken thralls. So again if you haven't been teleported yet work on killing the thralls before they get into into the black circle or I guess I should say sphere. Now a tip for you guys is that if Oryx starts to do this mechanic like he starts to teleport people and you have a player that's dead send three or more players to that person's corpse and just all stand there holding the revive button and the reason being is that you don't want to just send one person over to go and revive your dead teammate because he could be teleported halfway through and then you gotta send another person and then if he gets teleported it could result in some real problems. So send a bunch of teammates over they all hold revive and then and if a couple get teleported, you'll still be able to revive your dead teammate. In any event, once the players in the Misty Circle manage to kill the Shade of Orcs, you're all going to be teleported back into the main area. And guys, that's really it on how to beat Oryx, so I'm going to try to summarize this as best I can. He's going to slam a plate and then you're going to get whoever is the delegated relic grabber to jump on first. He's going to get torn between dimensions and then simply all players jump on one at a time counterclockwise leading up into the elevated platform to which the relic grabber is going to grab the relic hop down and take the invincibility bubble from the vessel of orcs at the same time the very fourth person you know where the actual thing ends doesn't need to hop on his plate he can go and help kill the ogres that are spawning and they're going to spawn at the same order of when you hop on your plate you need to kill these ogres as quickly as possible when they're dead they're going to drop these orbs of black light when you all meet in the middle of the map, when your relic carrier has grabbed the uh, circle of invincibility, you kill the vessel of Oryx as quickly as you can, and then just deal with some adds that are around. When Oryx's stomach opens, you go to town on his stomach, and then when he recoils backwards from damaging him, you run back to where your plate was and stand in the black orb of light, except for two players that weren't assigned to any plates, they simply stay in the middle and keep damaging Oryx. You stand in the black light until you see the text on your screen say that you have uh, uncontaminated the orb of light or whatever it says. You run back to the middle and continue damaging Oryx. Now apart from Oryx shooting these homing explosions at you that you simply need to run around in circles to avoid and getting teleported to a place where you need to kill the shade, that's really all the mechanics there are to it. Most teams are going to be able to kill Oryx after 4 sessions of damaging him. But don't worry if you're actually not able to damage him enough in doing it four times, it'll actually will be a fifth time so you have one more time to damage him just in case. 
Now the very, very last mechanic is that after you damage him, it, again it should be four times, so his health is going to be nothing, like on the fourth time you're going to shoot him, his health is going to be absolutely zero and he's going to disappear. At that point he's going to come up again at the very middle of the map where he first originally spawned. His stomach is going to open one more time and your team has to put as much damage on him as quickly as possible to kill him. If you don't, he'll clap his hands and kill your entire team. So if this is happening, he has no health and he's going to the middle, you want to pull all the stops, pop all the synths and just kill him again. Put as much damage on him as quickly as possible. This actually really isn't that difficult, especially if there's a couple of black spindles. So you'll be able to kill him, he'll float off into oblivion, and a chest will open, awarding you, hopefully, with some raid primary weapons. And finally, guys, that's it for this video. I really hope you enjoyed. Again, please remember to rate and share this video. It really helps me out. And if you enjoyed this video, you're probably going to enjoy more Destiny videos from me, so I wouldn't be afraid to slap that subscribe button. If you want to get in touch with me, the best way is on Twitter. That's going to be linked in the description of this video, as is my Twitch channel, which you can follow as well. Again, I really hope you enjoyed this video and found it helpful. And as always, have a good day.